Okay, thank you everybody for joining us for our wild lecture series. We are here with Jan Four from FWC. Um, she is a biologist with them. She focuses on non-native wildlife and educating and outreach uh, the community on what to do uh, concerning non-native wildlife. Um, as we were discussing, she was an animal trainer for years um, with her own business at SeaWorld and in places like Hawaii. So we are lucky to have her with us and um, I'm very excited to learn all about this subject. Uh, I know it's something that we get a lot of questions. So please make sure that your microphones remain on mute. Um, we will have a question and answer portion at the end of this lecture. So we will, we will both stay on and try to answer as many questions as possible. So thank you for joining us and the floor is yours. Oh, thank you guys so much. It's an honor and a privilege to be here and speak to you today on behalf of our agency, which I really enjoy working for, but it's also a subject I've become quite passionate about. So if anything comes up during this presentation that begs a question and doesn't get answered, by all means, hold that question and we'll try to get you an answer today. Or if I cannot answer it today, I'll make sure you have my email and we'll, we'll touch base later. But right now we're gonna dive into non-native fish and wildlife in Florida and what the FWC is doing to minimize impacts of invasive wildlife in the Sunshine State and how you can get involved. So our presentation has a, a variety of topics. I just wanna give you an overview and then if there's anything specific you wanna know, feel free and empowered to ask. But let's just dive right in here. So let's just do the basics in case anyone is joining us that hasn't really understood what's native, what's non-native, what's invasive. I kind of just want to give you that filter because it's rather easy to go through. You already know about native species. Many conservation minded folks know what our local native species are. They have an inclination to protect them. And you can see several of them represented on the green on the left. You can see reptiles, you can see mammals, you can see birds. Native species are naturally occurring. They didn't need any assistance from humans to be introduced into the environment, they were and are naturally occurring in the ecosystem. And all of the species you see here and many, many more are intrinsically valuable to Florida's ecosystem, to Florida's environment, and they may be negatively impacted by the introduction of non-native species represented in the red on the left. These are just a few examples of non-native species. These species do not occur naturally in the wild. That's the big difference between native and non-native. They do not occur naturally, which means they had to have been introduced, sometimes unintentionally, sometimes intentionally. We'll talk more about that in just a moment. But we have a variety represented here. We have fish in the center, some amphibians, and of course, multiple reptile species. The thing to remember about these species is that the FWC considers it a high priority to prevent the introduction because when non-native species go invasive, it becomes a problem. That means a non-native species becomes invasive when it adversely impacts the ecology, the economy, or human health and safety. Not every non-native species is an invasive species, and I want to make that really clear. It's just one of the fun things to start us off. Non-native doesn't necessarily mean negative, but the prevention of introduction is a high priority for our agency. So let's talk about non-native species. Is it really a problem? Come on, why does the FWC spend so much time dealing with this? Yes, the answer to that question is yes. If you look at that little map there and you see thousands of yellow data points, each one of those points is an individual animal that's a non-native animal, and each one of those points is a credible, verified observation of a non-native fish or wildlife species. And I wanna point out, 
lionfish aren't even on this map. That map would be far more yellow if lionfish were included. So if you break down those over 100,000 observations on this map, you will see that that represents over 500 non-native species. So that's over 100,000 individual animals observed, and that's from 1924 to now, and that breaks down to over 500 species. Guys, that's a lot of diversity out there, and that's not necessarily a good thing. It can be, but in the question of non-native species, this can become a problem when they negatively impact our ecology, economy, and human health and safety. And how do they do that? When they reproduce and establish populations and expand their ranges, then they may increase their potential to impact our wildlife. So of those five over 500, we know confirmed 139 are reproducing. It's likely more, but we can confirm 139 non-native species are out there in the wild in Florida reproducing right now. And I wanna point out that the lionfish program, our removal program is so successful since its inception in 2011, we've removed over 800,000 lionfish. So it's kind of mind blowing to think, whoa, you know, that's a big number and there are still many, many more out there. So the answer to that original question, is this a big deal? Are non-native species really a big deal? Yes. Let's take a look at it. Let's go back to 1985. This is when Jan was actually in, I think, middle school. And we can see our lionfish distribution in the north at Northwest Atlantic Ocean. And what we're looking at is that teeny tiny little red dot on Florida. It's practically nothing. And then I wanna fast forward from 85 to last year. Look at that, look at that expansion. Look at that coverage. This is the distribution of lionfish today. This is a quick expansion and lionfish represent a non-native species that became invasive. Why? Because they have very few natural predators here. Nothing eats lionfish on the regular. It's not a staple of any predator's diet in Florida waterways. And they can reproduce quickly in high numbers and they consume large amounts of native marine life. That's why they are a problem. So let's focus for a minute on how these animals got here. How are they introduced? If introduction is really the problem, if introduction is how non-natives get here, how are they introduced? Well, sometimes it's unintentional. This little mongoose, this is a Javan mongoose, he came over on a cargo shipment. So cargo shipments can include a lot of hitchhiking pathways. An example would be when a ship, a huge giant cargo ship takes on ballast water at their port, then they travel across an ocean, release that ballast water. That water can contain organisms that are not native to that environment. Animals like the mongoose may come over in shipments of natural goods. This mongoose came over in a shipment of sugar and it came from the Caribbean where that animal's not native either. So this animal was detected in Port Everglades by law enforcement and was trapped and removed. So it was not allowed to stay, unfortunately. But the hitchhiking is a small representation of how animals unintentionally get here. The real threat is from the live animal trade. And we'll talk more about the trade, but the real issue is that the most common known introduction pathway for non-native animals is through escape or release of animals that came here through the live animal trade. Now you guys already know it's illegal to release or, or to release any non-native species and you are held liable if your animal escapes if it's non-native. You have to make sure you have the biosecurity measures, the proper caging in place to prevent release or escape. So that is an illegal activity in Florida. And even though we've made it illegal to release these animals, we still know that they do come from the live animal trade. How do we know that? Are we sure? Come on, let's not blame the live animal trade. But a literature review conducted by our agency and our partners, and that means we went through the scientific published data, not our data, scientific data that's peer reviewed in journals. We went through that data for decades looking for evidence. And what we found, let's just highlight reptiles for a minute. Reptiles, there are 
180, at least 180 species of reptiles that have been introduced into Florida that do not naturally occur here. And of those 180, 166 were introduced from the live animal trade. So 92% of non-native reptiles came from the live animal trade. If you add up all of these taxonomic groups, birds, fish, amphibians, you see that it's nearly 600 introduced species. And of those, 80% came from the live animal trade. Can the trade be done well? Sure. But is it done poorly? Sometimes. Let's talk about that. We have in Florida a robust live animal trade. It's very active. We have a high number of pet shows, pet expos. People love their exotic pets in Florida. Additionally, we have in Florida multiple points of entry. We have a lot of shipping ports. So that means there's tons of live cargo coming in and out all of the time. Now, just to highlight reptiles and amphibians again, in the trade, there's about 4,000 species out there actively being traded and imported, but oversight's really only needed for the high-risk species, and that's one of the big things that our agency does. We have the authority to regulate what animals come in. We'll talk about that more in a moment, but I want to tell you why we regulate, because not every species that's non-native gets regulated. So why do some species thrive and why are some species given way more attention than other species? And sometimes this can be a talking point of contention for folks. So I wanna go over it, be really transparent with you about it. So one of the things that makes a species that's non-native thrive in Florida is if it has few natural threats, any natural predators. So if a species is introduced like a Burmese python, they don't have any main natural predator, something that eats it on the regular. Other animals, can and have been known to, but it's not a staple of their diet. So nothing's keeping Burmese pythons, for example, their populations in check. Another thing is our subtropical climate. We have a very suitable climate for species from places like South America, parts of Africa, parts of Asia. So we have a favorable climate that helps animals gain a foothold and establish here. Also, any animal that can function as a generalist diet, a generalist predator, their diet is designed where they can eat from just about any food sort, they, for source. They don't have to have a specific leaf, a specific bird, a specific snail to survive on. This animal can eat a little bit from everywhere. That's an animal that has the ability to do quite a bit of impact. And then we have high reproductive potential. Remember the lionfish? There are several reptiles and other species, other taxonomic groups that can reproduce in high litters, high egg clutches, high number of offspring, and can do so more than once a year. And then animals that may have high dispersal ability. So an animal that can travel easily over water and over land or disperse easily over just one of those, or if it's an air disperser, these are animals that we will take a look at to see if they have any impacts. Let's talk about those impacts for a second. Let's do the photos first because they're fun and interesting. So the photo you see here is of a tegu. That's a lizard. That lizard is a skilled egg predator. This is an animal known to raid nests, ground nests. So what nests on the ground? Some birds, American alligators, native to Florida, gopher tortoises, a protected species in Florida. It's listed as threatened. We want to protect our gopher tortoises. So a tegu, it represents a threat, threat of direct predation. Our gentleman there leaning up against that python, that's a python, and inside of that abdomen with his hand resting upon it is a white-tailed deer. That is a native species in Florida. So we know that pythons are preying on our native species, including the spoonbill, the bits of spoonbill there to the right. So these were also found in a Burmese python abdomen in a belly. And these are um, 
protected as well. So these are animals that we know are listed as imperiled and need protection. So we have to examine that when we discuss impact. So let's go back over to the left, to the green box. We've got direct predation, the impact to our ecology from direct predation. We've got habitat alteration. We've got competition for resources. And we've seen on our trail cameras, Burmese pythons, iguanas, tegus, burrowing animals, inhabit the burrows of our native burrowing species, like burrowing owls or the gopher tortoise, which we all know and love. And then there's also the risk to our ecology from disease or disease transmission or parasitic introduction. So then there are economic impacts, and I'll just gloss over those really quickly. Think about all of the damage burrowing animals that are non-native can do to roadways, can do to water control structures, sea walls. Millions of dollars have been spent dealing with the impact of non-native species that can cause this kind of damage. And then, of course, there are human health and safety impacts from non-native species as well. So let's just take a look at the generalist diet of a Burmese python. Burmese pythons tend to be the poster child for non-native species in Florida. So let's just talk about this. The chart on the left represents a hypothetical diet of what it would take to get a Burmese python from hatchling to about 13 feet in length. It would take at least five to seven years. And it's not the amount of food that this predator takes from the wild, although that can be a high amount. What I want you to look at is the different taxonomic groups. You've got mammals, you've got birds, you've got reptiles, a variety of species that this animal, once intro introduced into the ecosystem, it can gobble up all of these species from the Everglades and have severe impact on the entire ecosystem. White-tailed deer aren't even on this graph and we know they're eaten as well by this predator. So the generalist diet among other factors tends to be what we look at. And that diet, the, the climate are what enable certain animals to spread. So let's talk about the spread of Burmese pythons. I think this is interesting. In 1979, we saw the first recorded Burmese python removed from Everglades National Park. So fast forward just a few decades over to the right, and you'll see in 2020, now we have a much more established range. Burmese pythons are established in natural areas across South Florida, and you can still see that original red star and the expansion that happened, the dispersal that occurred in just a few short decades. Now, you may also be wondering what all these yellow dots are north of that concentration. So you see dots all the way up north of Lake Okeechobee, you see dots going up towards the Panhandle, all the way through Tampa Bay there. So these are credible, verified sightings of individual Burmese pythons who were released or escaped out into the wild. So these are animals that have not yet established a population like they did in South Florida. Are they capable? Well, temperature will limit certain factors if they go too far into a freeze area, South Florida doesn't get very many days of annual freeze, but further north they do. So temperature is a limiting factor, but this is why prevention is such a key. So let's talk about the invasion curve, how it happens. So what I wanna bring your attention to are the graph labels, first of all. So look over on our left, the area infested is going to grow, look on the bottom, over time. And then finally, look on the right. As the area infested grows over time, the control costs are going to increase. And if we go back to our left, that's why prevention is such a key component of what the FWC does and what our outreach and education is here for, is to prevent those introductions of high risk species. It's going to be the cheapest to manage and the easiest to manage. So prevention is a huge focus. Once you get out of prevention and introduction has occurred, then you're in eradication. And if you cannot eradicate, can you contain? And if you can't, 
then you're where the Burmese python is today in asset-based protection and long-term management. So protection for what? What do we need to protect from the Burmese python? Protection is needed for our bird rookeries, our rearing areas, for our critical wildlife areas, and for, as we've mentioned, our endangered and threatened species, whether they're state listed or federally listed. So when we go about planning preventative measures, we're gonna look at risk screening factors. Some of them you've already heard of. We've already talked about reproductive potential, dispersal, can they transmit diseases? Are they impacting our species? Are they impacting human health and safety? There are a few more listed there, but we take all those screening factors and develop a summary. Now this summary is given to managers, managers of wildlife. What do we need to do based on these facts, on this summary? Is this animal a low risk, medium risk, high risk? What do we need to do? Do we need more data? Do we need to involve partners? Do we need to educate the public? And or do we need to regulate this species? So we'll spend one or two more slides on regulation and then we're gonna to get to actual control. So in Florida with non-native species, there are two categories for regulation, just for non-natives. All captive wildlife is regulated, but non-natives are either, if they're not regulated at all, that's fine. There are many that are not. If they are regulated, they're conditional or prohibited. What does it mean to be conditional? You can't have it as a pet and you need a permit to do just about anything else with it, like sell it, exhibit it, or research it. And all of those permits come with strict biosecurity measures. Those are caging requirements and annual inspections and annual permit renewals. So examples of conditional species would be freshwater stingrays. Many of the species on our current conditional regulated species list are aquatic species. They're highly regulated in Florida because of their high risk potential to have impact on native species should they escape or be released. Now underneath that is a red-eared slider and this is a unique animal. Uh, this animal you can apply for a special permit to possess it as a pet and we are always looking for red-eared slider adopters with our exotic pet amnesty program. So just want to put that bug in your ear. If you want to do something for conservation, consider becoming a red-eared slider adopter. You can still apply for the specific permit of becoming an adopter and helping us out. So let's go up a category. The highest category for non-native regulations is the prohibited category. Again, no personal possession is a pet and you can no longer sell it. You can't import it, for, import it for the purpose of commercial sales. There are still some limited exceptions for exhibition and research, but they all come with that strict biosecurity caging measure and annual inspections and permit renewals. So those would apply to things like Burmese pythons, now tegus and iguanas. Now uh, we also have green anacondas. That's another one that went prohibited this year. There are other animals like piranhas pictured here that no one can own at any time, not even for research or exhibition. Sea snakes are another good example. Nobody can import those into the state for any purpose. So prohibited species are uh, highly regulated species in Florida. But I wanna point out what happens. If a species wasn't regulated before, now it is, so we have a rule change, and the owner of that species, the person in possession, doesn't want to keep it. Maybe they're scared of the rules. Maybe it's too much of a hassle. What if they didn't know there was a rule? What if two years from now somebody figures out their pet iguana is a now a prohibited species in Florida? What do they do? They can surrender it legally free of charge. The FWC has the exotic pet amnesty program. And it's one of the things that I am fortunate enough to get to manage. And what it does is provides amnesty. That means forgiveness for individual pet owners. There's no penalty. You kept it illegally for three years. We don't care. It's okay. You can turn it into us and there's no cost. It is also available to non-native species that aren't regulated. So anything that's non-native that was kept as a pet, a sugar glider, that's not a native species. Uh, let's see what else, a bearded dragon. 
um, all kinds of things. Ball pythons are a popular surrender. We get quite a few reptiles. You can surrender non-native fish to us. We are always recruiting adopters to help rehome these species. So what we're doing is providing anyone with the legal alternative to pet release and the alternative to releasing any non-native species into the wild. Uh, so far to date, since the program started in 2006, we have had 6,700, more than 6,700 animals surrendered through our program. And of that 6,700, over 1,000 were regulated species. So that means 1,000 species that are prohibited or conditional were saved from being released or into the wild. That's a huge deal. We have year-round operations, and when not in COVID, we do hold events at local zoos. We try to go all over the state, but here on this page are the hotline or the email account where you can email us if you want to surrender an animal or become an adopter. So, Let's take a little moment and transition. What I wanna do now for the rest of the, the slides, and we're about halfway through in case anybody's wondering, we're just over halfway. So what I wanna do is tell you how you can get involved and why your involvement is so important to not only our agency, but scientists, other partners, national parks, other places, the district, South Florida Water Management District. We have quite a few partners out there in the battle for invasive species, and we need your help. What can you do? And the answer is report, report, report. We can't respond and react unless we know where the animals are. And I cannot tell you before I worked for the agency, the number of times I saw a non-native species and just let it go. I didn't know where or how to report it. So this is where you can do that. We have three options. There's a website. The second option is a smartphone app you can download. And the third one is our exotic species hotline. So you can call or download, click and report at any time. Now, what are the elements of a good report? It's a good photo, a high quality photo where we can see and identify the species. We've had photos where a Burmese python was supposedly in a tree and it turned out to be a vine. It wasn't the person's fault, they're not gonna get any closer, but we needed to know before we sent a biologist out there that it was a vine and not really a python. So a good photo is crucial. GPS coordinates are preferred and the date so we know where and when that animal was seen. And I want to talk for just a moment about why identification is so important. So here are three species of reptile that are occurring in Florida, some of them not naturally. Two are native. One is non-native. Do you know which one's the alligator, which one's the crocodile, and which one's the caiman? It's hard to tell, especially when they're juveniles like this. Now, I bet some of you already have it, but I'm going to reveal it. It's this guy. This is a spectacled caiman, not a native species. The other two naturally occur in Florida. This one does not. So being able to identify helps our biologists and our law enforcement conserve their resources and apply them where they're really, really needed. Let's do one more and I bet you're more familiar with it. Cane toad or Southern toad? Which is which? Because one's non-native, one's native, one's toxic, one's not. So this is kind of a big deal. Do you know which one is the cane and which one is the southern? Do you know which one's toxic? I bet a bunch of you do. So this is the toxic cane toad on your right. The southern toad is on your left. How do you identify them? Well, let's take a look. I've got another photo here. So cane toad's still on your right. Southern is still on your left. What I want to point out, let's look at our native southern tone, left side first. Native southern toad has a dorsally expanded head, so it means his head is longer top to bottom. The cane toads is more flat, more dorsally compressed. Behind the eyes of the southern toad are clear ridges, cranial crests, they call them. Cane toad doesn't really have those. And then the big deal is this gland. You can see it kind of outlined in red on the cane toad. That gland is where the bufa toxin is contained and produced. And that means that this animal is toxic to anyone who licks it, bites it, ingests it, which usually means our pets. So it can kill a dog in less than 30 minutes. It can be toxic to a human if they handle it. And that includes the cane toad, 
cane toed eggs. So be very, very careful if you think you have a cane toed, make sure you wear proper equipment if you're trying to remove it and make sure you're not destroying southern toads in the process. So let's do a quick slide review of some of our high priority species. What does the FWC consider to be high priority species for removal and response, control and management? Well, the one that you know is the Burmese python. You can see some identification points here on the slide and they're easy to see in that photo. But what I really want you to focus on is the red in the map. You've seen that already in a previous map. And you see that that established area is all across South Florida. The biggest establishment is highlighted in yellow and you can still see those individual data points traveling further north. You may even be able to see on that tiny little map, one in the panhandle, uh, a couple up north actually, but one all the way up in the panhandle and that these are representations of likely escaped or released pets. So these are in established populations we want to prevent. We do not want these animals to meet up, make a bunch of baby pythons and establish a foothold any further north than they already are. Now, what's the good news? The good news is that this animal is regulated as prohibited. That prevents a lot of introduction. And we have removed over 13,000 of them to date. That's a big deal. Let's look at a few more in the same way. The Northern African Python, good news, much fewer, or sorry, much smaller population. Look at the map. That's their hotspot. That's their establishment just in Miami-Dade County. So that feels good, doesn't it? Okay, woo, one less thing I have to worry about. We've removed over 70 of them. They are also listed as prohibited. And as we continue to go with removal efforts, our hope, knock on wood and cross your fingers, gang, that we could eventually eradicate. Do you remember that from the invasion curve? Maybe it's still possible to eradicate this species. We'll let you know when we know. We're out there fighting for it every day. So let's talk about non Python animals. Let's talk about a few lizards you may be familiar with. The Nile monitor is really cool. This is a semi-aquatic species. So remember dispersal ability is one of the factors we look at. This animal can travel quite easily over land and in water. They often inhabit our canal banks. We do regular surveys for Nile monitors on our canals on this side of the state, on the Fort Lauderdale side. Our team's always going out. They have established populations in two places in Palm Beach and Lee counties. Interesting, isn't it? Why didn't they establish in between? And the most likely explanation is because the release of escape or escape of pets from commercial breeders who were working in the live animal trade and didn't follow the biosecurity measures, unfortunately resulted in these two disjunct populations. We have removed over 850 to date. Now this animal just went on the prohibited species list and other species, this is the Argentine black and white tegu, but we have prohibited all species of tegu and they are established in disjunct populations in four locations, Miami-Dade, Charlotte, Hillsborough and St. Lucie counties. This is that egg predator. You remember the little guy earlier in the slideshow that was raiding the alligator nest? This is him. They represent a very unique ecological impact that we want to address, which is one of the reasons why their risk summary came back as a high risk and the reason why they went on the prohibited species list. Over 10,000 have been removed to date. Now this, you may not be familiar with. Some of you I know already are. Many more of you are familiar with green iguanas. Green iguanas are everywhere in Florida. They're also prohibited, the green iguana. But let's talk about this lesser known guy, the black spiny tailed iguana. Now you can tell this iguana from others. I will tell you identification can be difficult. You need to look at the tail. The tail has whirls of spikes coming out of it, whirls of spikes going all the way down, spiraling down that tail. Your green iguana, no matter what color it is, will not have those spikes. This animal has less formed populations. They're far more disjunct and disorganized. That's why you don't see any yellow on this map. They are established here. They are invasive. 
and they're being spotted more and more. This is an animal we want your reports of. We would love to know where you have seen this. So you can go on that downloadable app. You can actually see distribution maps. You can log your report and do something good for us and our partners to know where they're expanding their range to and where we should be looking. Okay, one last species for you, a fish species for all my anglers out there. The bullseye snakehead. Florida is the only state that has an established population. Other states do have populations of snakeheads, but it's a different species. So these are established in Broward County and Palm Beach County. They have ecological impacts and they can survive. They're very unique. They're air breathing fish. They're capable of breathing air. So that means they can survive in low oxygen concentrations of water because all they have to do is pop up and take a breath. That gives them a foothold over native species and they have been seen eating a variety of native species. And it's really exciting work what our non-native fish team is doing right now to analyze what this animal is doing, where it's found, and how it's a threat. So this animal is prohibited already and because anglers don't always report their catches we estimate that several thousand have been removed. So let's wrap up now. I want to give you a picture of what the agency is out there doing for you every day and how you can get involved. So when we talk about early detection and rapid response we often refer to that as EDRR. We need first and foremost, a report. We need somebody to call us up, drop us a line, report this guy. Any of those high priority species you just saw and more, we want your reports. Don't necessarily need your reports of green iguanas unless you see them outside of their established range. They're all over South Florida. If you go up to North Florida and you start seeing iguanas running around, yeah, sure, report that. But any of those high priority species you just saw, we want to know where they are so we can go out and help control and remove. So is your report credible? Can we verify it? Is it a high priority species? And do we have the biologist or the law enforcement to respond? That will determine if we can go out. But our response team isn't just FWC staff. We have our agency partners. We have tons of volunteers. And I'm so proud to say we have paid contractors. But I want to show you why it can get dicey to um, do an, an EDRR. So hopefully this video plays. I want to show you what our biologists are willing to do to go out there and remove high priority species. So this is one of our biologists who saw this animal on a canal bank, was willing to dive into the tunnel to retrieve it. And good thing he did. This is an Asian water monitor and this was a pregnant female. So this resulted in the removal of over 30 eggs. That is a huge win for native species. That is the way that we can help protect our native wildlife. So let's talk about control and management for our pythons, since they are the poster child for our non-native and invasive control and management programs. We have multiple ways that public can get that the public can get involved and one of those is anyone who's experienced in python hunting can become a contractor for us or the south florida water management district we pay people to conduct surveys remove snakes and nests so these are just some photos of our contractors in action but i want to give you some stats because i'm really proud of those 13,000 pythons that have been removed and reported to the fwc I want you to pay attention to when the contractor program started. Look down at the years, the calendar years on the bottom of our graph. Can you see in 2017 when the paid contractor programs started? Spike, big spike in the number of snakes removed. To date, those 13,000 that have been removed, our contractors are responsible for over 6,500, so roughly half. This is an amazing success story of public engagement and citizen science. So let's go on to other coordination that we do. We have Tega removal programs with our partners, National Park Service, University of Florida, USGS. We have contractors that set trap lines and go out and check those traps to remove tegus, Nile monitors all the time. We have Nile monitor canal surveys that we are conducting constantly. 
and we are willing to loan traps. We have an entire trap loan program to landowners that have seen invasive species on their property and may not be comfortable removing them themselves. By the way, when we get to the question and answer, if you guys want to know more about removal options and euthanasia options, I'll be happy to answer those questions. So can you get involved? Yes, sure you can. One of our other fun programs that is going on right now is our Python Challenge. Our Python Challenge is a 10-day hunting competition for Python hunters, novice or professional, does not matter. You can go out and remove pythons on these competition lands. You can win big prizes, but the real purpose of the event is it's an education and outreach event. We get a lot of media attention for it, and it's not the number of snakes we capture, it's the number of people that we reach to educate on why pythons are a threat and how they can get involved and what they can do. So we train people. We have online training during COVID. We're going to resume in-person training later this year. We train you how to catch pythons. And I am a graduate of that program. I have never caught a snake. I don't like snakes in my life. I am not a snake person. I've taken that training. I am confident I could go out and catch a python now and help. It's empowering as a woman, especially as a minority, to be able to do that. So it's lovely to reach out to groups who thought they could never participate before and say, yes, you can. We do offer prizes during the competition, and I just want to highlight last year's event. It was centered around the Super Bowl in January. We had over 750 people participating out there hunting pythons, and they represented 20 states. Now, another fun fact, last year, our executive director signed this little document. This is Executive Order 2017. Now, what does that mean? It means that anyone can go out year round. You don't have to wait for Python Challenge to come around. Anyone is now capable of going out onto 25 different managed lands. That's a lot of land, folks. And these are where pythons are living. You can go out to these lands and you can lethally take, which means humanely kill, invasive reptiles like Burmese pythons, like iguanas, like lizards, like the Nile monitor. You can humanely kill these animals and you don't need a permit and you don't need a hunting license. You can also do the same anytime year round with landowner permission on private lands. So we have all the resources you need to get you started. If you ever visit our non-native page and you can simply Google FWC non-natives and this page will come right up, it has tons of resources. It has the resources to get you to report things. It has the resources to identify Burmese pythons and other animals. It has the resources for the exotic pet amnesty program. Everything you want is off of this homepage. You can also get out there and not just report it, you can remove it. You can join our Patrick program if you're an experienced contractor and want or experienced python hunter and want to be paid for it. You can join our Python Patrol Safe Capture trainings, become a graduate. It's really quick and it will teach you how to go out and catch pythons. And you can also sign up and put those skills to good use and participate in the Florida Python Challenge. Furthermore, we don't want you to let it loose. If you're a responsible pet owner, we want you to become an adopter. We need adopters, gang. I cannot stress it enough. We are always looking for adopters that are qualified, that have the know-how, and that will protect our native Florida wildlife by never releasing this pet into the wild. If you're interested in becoming an adopter, I want to hear from you. And then finally, for your community, your school, your group, we have all of the digital and print resources you could possibly need to get the word out about any of these species, to get the word out about how to report, to get the word out about pet amnesty. We've got it all. All you have to do is tap me for that. And, and it's, a lot of it's on our web pages already. And I can get that for you. And with that, we're going to call this presentation ending. I went over my time just a little bit. I do apologize, but I hope it was worth your wait. And we'll um, launch it back to you guys for question and answer. And I'll stop sharing my screen. Well, thank you so much. That was very educational. I'm glad you guys enjoyed it. Would love to hear from, from anybody in attendance. I will uh, let others go first. Uh, don't be shy. 
Um, if you want, you can ask your questions in the chat and I can read them if you prefer, or you can just unmute yourself and ask any questions. I have a question. Um, do you typically, like, what is your advice for someone who's trying to, uh, you know, get involved, but is also like really sensitive? Like, I can't even kill a spider. I can't, you know what I mean? Like, does that go away? Do you sort of toughen up? <laughs> Yes and no. So let me confess to you guys, I love being transparent about this. And it's one of the hardest parts about our job. I am a hippie. I am a peace loving gal. I can't kill spiders either. I, I am uncomfortable with that aspect of anything to do. I, I am very, anything to do with wildlife. I am very much in my heart of hearts as a human, a person who's like, can't they all just get along? Let's leave them alone and let nature sort it out. The scientist in me is what changed it. And that education, I will say, is what helps it go away, what helps the squeamishness become manageable. I will say this, that invasive species science is not easy. And no, um, conservation biology is easy. And I will talk to you like this. It's always analogous to parenting. You know how you have to say no sometimes and the tears are just coming and you don't want to be the bad guy. And sometimes for its own good, you have to be the bad guy. So when we go out and we remove these animals, first things first, they must be humanely killed. Humane killing is the only way all of our invasive reptiles are protected by Florida's anti-cruelty statutes. And we do report and reprimand anyone who uh, is suspected of not humane killing. So we're very strict and we abide by all of those laws ourselves. Have I done it, done the humane killing myself? Yes, yes I have. It is my least favorite part of my job. And I say my little Buddha prayer for the snake every single time. I'm very, very willing to be transparent about it because it, it will always be unsavory. It will always be a war in my personal being. The peace loving hippie will always war with the scientist, but the science wins because I know their threats. I know that if I release this animal, the damage it can do. And I know I cannot sit back and continue to allow it to happen. And that's where my personal justification comes in. But yes, folks can get involved and there are ways to report animals and have biologists come out and take care of the problem, especially those high priority species. So I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you. You're very we welcome. Have, we have two questions in the chat. The first one is, um, can we have the link to the Python coaching training? Um, if there's any way we can put that in the chat or- um... Absolutely. Let me look that up for you. Pardon my thousand yard gaze as I look that up for you. I'm gonna open a browser real quick and get you that. I'll drop it right in the chat for you. And then the second question is, um, what about the people who are killing the green iguanas? if you can discuss that a little bit. Absolutely. Um, let me get that, because I want to give that my full attention. So if you mm -hmm. guys will bear with me real quick, because I can get you the workshops page. Um, so there are a couple things I'm going to give you right now. This link that I'm about to drop in the chat, copy, and let me go back to you lovely people and open up the chat, here we go. And I'm gonna paste this right now. Guys, this is a link to our workshops and there are two on there. There's an iguana management workshop that we do and it's virtual just like this one. It runs about the same length of time and it's iguana specific. So mm. if you wanna book another one, I'm available, but it's also for the Python patrol. That's what you want. Anybody who's interested in taking the safe capture training. Now, right now, the Python Patrol is all online. So there's a PDF of a PowerPoint. So you can literally look at the PowerPoint and then you can watch our safe capture videos as well. They're really cool. And if you can't find those, I can also direct you to multiple other sources where those videos are listed. So you can watch everything that we do in a Python Patrol class. 
But starting in September, our in-person classes will resume and we do give you hands-on training. You get to catch your own Python. We bring live Pythons and we teach you how to do it. So anybody that's like, I really need that. I really need to get over that hurdle of, of being scared that if I go out by myself, how am I going to catch it? We will offer those trainings beginning again in September and the the calendar will be posted at this link. Now, let me go back to the iguana question. So is the question regarding um, folks that are killing iguanas now, because legally they are authorized to do so. And that is a control and management thing that is good. We want the population limited. So anyone, I have a guy in my neighborhood, he's a friend of mine, his name is Bob. <laughs> Bob goes around and he works with local law enforcement to make sure they're aware when he's shooting. And Bob goes around and gets permission from all the apartment complexes in the, my local area. And he will remove iguanas. He is legally allowed to do that. It's private property because it's owned by each apartment complex. And all he has to do is wear a little orange vest so people know what he's doing and don't think he's a terrorist of any kind. And Bob goes out and removes iguanas. This is legal and it is authorized and the FWC does encourage folks to remove invasive reptiles anytime they can. Does that answer your question or was your question a little bit different? Uh, I think it was it was about the killing uh, of iguanas, the, the question in the chat. Uh, and I think uh, part of it too is the inhumane killing of iguanas is illegal, even though the FWC does allow the removal of iguanas. Uh, but inhumane, regardless of their uh, legal status here, is still illegal. Correct. You have to do it humanely. And I'll go over that really quickly. What does that mean? They cannot be drowned, shocked, chemicals. You can't smoke them out of a burrow. None of that is allowed. So if anybody's curious, and I know this can be unsavory, usually a small caliber firearm, a captive bolt gun, or a pellet air gun rifle that is sold for small game hunting, not a BB gun, they're usually not effective, but a pellet rifle that is uh, sold to marketed for small game removal. These are acceptable methods and it is recommended and usually required that the um, firing the shot be one shot, one kill. So that means you have to be close enough and your aim has to be good. So this isn't, it should never be a blood sport. Should yeah. never, it should always never be. BB, never a BB practice anything of that sort. Exactly, exactly. It's a, it's a very difficult topic. And I see, I see in the chat, I totally understand. And you're not required to um, take action yourselves, not at all. You can definitely leave that unsavory part to professionals, totally fine. And there are quite a few trappers that will remove as well. It, it's not pleasant guys, and I understand that. It, it is a method of protection for our native wildlife. And that's that's really, really what it's all about. And I know you're joking. I know. But uh, about the fruit, uh, should I stop feeding them my leftover fruit? Yes, please. I know you're being silly. Um, um, I, I have made that mistake before. I just want you guys to know, as much as I am a biologist for the agency, have I made those, those novice uninformed mistakes? Yes, of course. I've gone out and fed wildlife. I know better now. And education is why it's so important. Education changes everything. So I'll let you continue. I just want to make that point. No, no, no. Uh, as a stand from the, S, uh, from the South Florida Wildlife Center, we are um, not a big proponent of feeding wildlife, native or non-native. Um, we feel that it does not provide a healthy, balanced diet for them and can cause things like metabolic bone diseases. Um, it can cause infections, things like that. So we do uh, really advocate for not feeding wildlife, whether native or non-native. Um, that is um, so uh, I have a question here. Does the SFWC ever offer wildlife rehabilitation training for native species? Uh, we do not offer a training to become a rehabilitator, a licensed rehabilitator. What we do offer is training for our volunteers to volunteer here on property and help us rehabilitate wildlife. So if you are interested in having an um, hands-on or even a hands-off um, approach to wildlife, um, you are welcome to become a volunteer. Um, many of the volunteers have 
a variety of roles here, whether they're hands-on or hands-off, uh, mm -hmm. but we do not provide the training. But um, there are great uh, resources online on how to become a licensed rehabilitator. Um, do, 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 do. Let's see, what are requirements in order to be an exotic pet adopter and how do I, be, how do I become that liability? All you have to do, I'm dropping it in the chat right now. And I think we might have missed an earlier question too. I was trying to scan real quick, but I lost it. So in the chat right now, gang, is the pet amnesty email, pet amnesty at myfwc.com. All you have to do is send an email to that address saying, I want to become an adopter. We're going to email you the form. You fill that out. And once you fill that out, we process it and you're an adopter in the program. So it's relatively easy. It takes less than two weeks on most cases. And we just do a background check to make sure you don't have any wildlife violations with our agency. So it's not a, you don't provide us your social. It's not a, like a criminal background check. We just make sure there's no wildlife violations on record with our agency. And we do that with your name and your birth date, which are on that application. And then you are an FWC adopter and you can specify what types of animals you want to adopt. If you want mammals or birds or reptiles or only large snakes and not small snakes, you mm. can specify that. It's all there. So just send us an email for, at that address. Okay. Uh, the question came back. I'm um, the one that was that we skipped over. Um, and let me read it real quick. It is, if the SFWC receives an injured non-native species wildlife, would the SFWC euthanize it? Uh, great question. Uh, we get this one all the time. So we follow all the laws. Um, we are regulated like any other organization by uh, state and federal uh, so because of our standing and the laws, things like that, certain, um, animals are an automatic euthanasia, like the pythons because of their legal standing. Other, uh, wildlife, we ask our volunteer, our, the finder, if they're willing to take it to a private veterinarian, because they are by law allowed to take it to a private veterinarian and have ownership over it like a pet. Um, it is illegal for them to then release it into the wild. So we follow all the rules. Um, we will help you in treating any animal, um, but if an animal is um, in grave injury, if it is not able to sustain life on its own, um, we believe that the best method uh, is to euthanize. Um, we don't believe in uh, letting an animal suffer un uh, needlessly. So I hope that answers your question, and I know it's a very difficult question. Um, to kind of navigate through. So I am happy to have a conversation uh, after this chat privately with you if, if you if that wasn't enough of an answer for you. Okay. Do we have any other questions? People want to say anything in the chat or um, unmute themselves? So um, for us, for us on our end, we ask anybody that brings in uh, wildlife to uh, report it, native or non-native, um, to inform us of the location where they found that animal, native or non-native. Um, so that does help us. And um, for FWC, I don't know. Yes. If you see a non-native species, especially one of those high priority, high risk species to the environment, then yes, reporting it is absolutely crucial okay i do have a question for you i know we get a lot of talk about it and i'm sure these days you are getting a lot of discussion about it um so the coyote i know it's very popular on the news on all the next door apps and things like that um uh i know i have spoke to fwc officers before but i would like you to clarify perhaps does the fwc consider the coyote a non-native species there are a lot of words surrounding coyotes and some of them have different scientific meanings. Mm -hmm. So apologies, this particular animal, um, 
it's a different classification and I won't get too far in the weeds, but this animal expanded its range. So it wasn't introduced in the same way, say a Burmese Python was through the live animal trade. This animal expanded its range. It is here now. And the FWC's position on the coyote is that we have to figure out how to live together. Mm -hmm. So there are several videos on, or sorry, there is a video and several resources on our website of ways that you can live with them without inviting them into your property, ways that you can, I always like the word deter rather than haze. Haze to me takes me back to high school and I don't like it. <laughs> not fun. So I don't ever want to do that to a wild animal, um, but I would like to deter them. Animals will choose areas where they have abundant food and they feel safe and nothing's bothering them. So it's just like me. If I'm in an airport and I'm at my gate and somebody's bothering me, I'm going to get up and I'm going to go to another gate. And I don't feel bad. It wasn't the worst day I ever had. So this is kind of the approach that we want to bring to deterring methods for anything. Coyotes, there are many deterring methods for iguanas, for example, because they're often on private properties. So yes, the FWC, uh, to answer your question, the FWC is not going to come out and remove coyotes. They do want to know about conflict with coyotes, but most of the resources on our coyote page are there to reduce that yeah. conflict. So that way you don't have to go bother a biologist. If you bother them, if there's a need, absolutely. We want to know, you've got a coyote attacking your family. Let's talk about it. But otherwise, let's make sure we don't invite those animals onto our properties. Let's make sure we deter them from taking up residence with us. Perfect. Thank you so much. Okay. Well, I think that is the end of our question and answer section. And thank you so much for, for having this chat with us. Uh, we have, I know personally, I have learned a lot. Um, I will be posting this on our uh, YouTube channel later today so that anybody can go back, share it, watch it again. And if you have any questions, you can email me or um, I, I know through FW, the website, uh, the public can contact you as well. Absolutely. Happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you so much.